introduction. Thank you for staying with us to the last talk. And uh, we are a bit late, and I hope, uh, I don't know, you know, try whether I can catch up with the, uh, uh, with the time. Uh, let me talk about some of the experience that we did uh, to making a high-density optical uh, stimulation uh, pro here in Michigan. And, you know, we had a lot of uh, talks uh, yesterday and today in optogenetics. I don't have to repeat this um, because I'm the last talk. And, uh, and optogenetics uh, uh, allow us, uh, all the neuroscientists, to do a, a tease out the brain activity at, to the circuit level by stimulating uh, specific target neurons uh, at the given uh, specific wavelength. And when I take a look at this technology, um, and it looks like a crude to me uh, because most of the work has been done by sticking optical fiber into the, the brain uh, of the animal. Is there a better way to do that? And people try to you know, uh, pursue uh, some of the better way and, and, and deliver the light to the local target region of the brain. And one of the obvious approach is having a tetrode wrap up with the optical fiber um, and having a, a recording and, and also delivering light together. The other one, which is really intriguing to me, my uh, collaborator also, uh, Franz uh, Iran Star, uh, who was working at Basaki Lab, he actually um, manually uh, assembled the thinned optical fiber onto a silicon probe and having an amazing uh, measurement done. When I take a look at this, um, quickly uh, say that as a MEMS engineer, we may integrate this delivering uh, light waveguide onto the silicon uh, substrate uh, directly. That's what we did, and uh, Il Chujo, who gave a talk uh, yesterday, who is now at uh, uh, KIST, but he did uh, the first work here, and uh, we thought it's pretty uh, trivial because we having a optical waveguide integrated onto the silicon. We, we first tried uh, with the SUA, uh, which is polymer, uh, because we wanted to have a really uh, tall structure uh, to mitigate some of the uh, misalignment issues here, so make us uh, life much easier. And uh, having this optical fiber coming back with the MEMS, uh, uh, the deep ion edge structure and delivering light to the distal end where the recording uh, electrodes are located. And we make this, but it took a little longer time than I expected to get actual in vivo data. And uh, after that, we are changing our waveguide structure because polymer would not be really good for chronic recording, um, possible delamination. We switched into the a dialectic waveguide, uh, has a uh, five micron uh, intrusion as compared to polymer, which is a 15 micron, much better, uh, much less tissue damage, uh, which may be working better. Also, there is no uh, um, water absorption uh, to the polymer structure. Therefore, you can give a better longevity of the lifetime. And we can successfully deliver the light to the distal end and, uh, and achieve uh, 10x higher uh, optical efficiency as compared to this uh, polymer wave, right? And we took uh, this probe to the uh, Basaki lab, and this is the uh, uh, first acute in vivo measurement done. Uh, we have this light coming out from here and then recording from these A channels. And you can see uh, this is sinusoidal optical stimulation. <laughs> and you see uh, pink uh, neurons and, and red neurons. And uh, as you can see, uh, the red neuron is firing, uh, synchronized with this uh, the optical stimulation pretty well, while there is a little delay in these pink cells. And th this is a process done here, and then when you take a look at this, and red cells, we identify that most of these 70%, it is synchronized with the stimulation of the light uh, with the short delay like a four millisecond, uh, suggesting this is the direct light effect, while the pink one has a latency around 40 millisecond and that population uh, has a network-driven stimulation uh, through the uh, neuronal connections. So this is the first work that we did. Um, and uh, naturally, uh, MEMS, uh, and optical MEMS has been pretty much uh, um, a hot topic in 1999 and 2000 before dot-com bubbles. And a lot of uh, optical MEMS component has been integrated. Natural ways that we can making an optical splitter 
an optical mixer. So when the light is coming from one side and then it will be split it into and then eliminated into the multiple uh, distal end. That's one way. And also we can make an optical mixer uh, so that the light can be from the other two sources can be switched through this mixer. So in a way that we can uh, having a blue uh, light coming here for channel rhodopsin activation and, and then yellow one coming by switching the light to activating halorhodopsin for inhibition of the neural activities. So that's a doable, uh, but here as you can see all, all these optical fibers are connected from the source. And, and for chronic recording, if you're having a more than two optical fibers are hang around, and you have a big tethering problem. So for chronic recording, uh, we wanted to have an integration of this uh, source onto the, uh, close to the probe, uh, not onto the silicon, but, but you know, at least we wanted to integrate onto the, the packaged PCB module. And one of my students come, out, come up with the uh, good idea, and we're looking for the source, and we're looking for LED. And the one thing is that why don't we use a blue ray? This is blue, uh, the laser diode. But can we get the unpackaged uh, the, the devices? That was the question. And we found the source. We can provide unpackaged the uh, laser diode. And uh, the other one is how do we uh, minimize uh, misalignment um, you know, tolerance here? So here is the uh, source, and then you know, we are using green lens, which is a gradient index, which means that there's a gradient of the index. Therefore, even though this uh, laser source, which is culminated light, uh, very small, um, the outlet, and then you know, even though we have some misalignment up to 20 micron, we can good guidance of the light, which is coming out the other end of the green lens, which will allow us to making a pretty good uh, packaging uh, with the high yield. And uh, this is the uh, schematic. Uh, you have, we have a probe here fabricated. And we are making a jig uh, through the micromachining technology. And uh, we assemble this. And we friction bonding this, the uh, laser source with the di two different wavelength. And then we can, um, having a, this green lens uh, self-assemble so that once we have a good alignment between uh, this uh, light source to the waveguide and uh, this green, will pave the way to making, allow us to having a good alignment. And also, this green uh, get us to a good thermal control, because if you have a butt coupling uh, from the light source directly to the silicon, and silicon is a very good thermal conductor, and it will heat up at the tip of the probe. And this is a thermal modeling uh, with and without green. And you can see the green can serve as a thermal insulator. Therefore, minimize the temperature increase of the silicon shank uh, and when you uh, stimulate uh, the light and the optical efficiency here through the coupling, it's not really high. Therefore, we end up pretty much high uh, illumination from the back and some portion of the light will be coming up from this distal end. So this is the packaged one and recently we uh, presented this and having uh, and here you, can, you don't see it because we have a cap for shielding purpose and we put a nice M here the Michigan, and inside you have a light source in the back, and through the green, it's pouring light onto the waveguide. And this is the uh, distal end, here's a waveguide with the recording side, and we can switch uh, the wavelengths uh, by turning on and off the LD in the back, so you can have a blue, you can have a red, and you can turn on both of the light, uh, providing two wavelengths simultaneously too. And also, we took it to, uh, uh, to the Pesaki lab, and uh, Iran also having some measurement. And this is the uh, spontaneous uh, waveform. Uh, this is the raw data, not processed. And you have a spikes here. And when we're having a blue light coming here, and then it's a ch channel rhodopsin, we can see this is the stimulation. And, 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 and coming to this intraneuron and, and channel rhodopsin expression and stimulation, and when you have this uh, red light, this is not, we didn't use a halo rhodopsin, this is an arch rhodopsin. Uh, the wavelength is a little different. And we can see we can suppress uh, uh, the neural activity. And you can see a pretty good correlation between uh, this light uh, illumination. And this uh, arch rhodopsin was expressed in uh, pyramid neurons. So here, uh, we wanted to move on to that, uh, and how 
can we uh, integrate it at the light source, uh, the multiple uh, stimulation? So this is the one that uh, Kamal uh, and, and also John is working together, have a multiple chain, and they actually assemble uh, the friction bonding of the, uh, the LD in the back, and eventually this is the, the device that we are uh, we wanted to deliver uh, to, the, to the community uh, through this brain initiative uh, project together. The next one that I wanted to talk about is a micro LED probe. You have seen this uh, before in the previous presentation. The question that we asked is whether can we just directly integrate a uh, light source onto the probe shank? Is it possible? And then we don't have to worry about assembly and we don't have to worry about the optical loss. So we come up with this idea that uh, and can we integrate onto this micro LED, which is a neuronal size, a 10 micron size. The actual size is 10 by 15 micron. And uh, as close to the recording site or any place that you want, a multiple illumination site, uh, to achieve a high special resolution. Um, and and luckily, uh, nowadays, people putting a lot of effort to making a blue LED for lighting business, uh, LED lighting. And the most of them putting their uh, substrate onto the sapphire because of lattice mismatching. And now we have a, this uh, gallium nitride uh, uh, layer uh, the, grown onto the silicon so that we can do the micro-machining because sapphire is very difficult to handle. Uh, we can't really pattern them. So we grow, um, now we grow, we got the wafer from Nanogan. Uh, the quantum well layer was grown uh, for specific wavelengths, which is 470 and 450 nanometer. And then we are making uh, this uh, micro LED structure. And we have a brilliant, I have a brilliant uh, student, uh, Fanu. Uh, he is brilliant, but also very brave. Uh, this is a very high risk project um, because we don't know whether we can make a really micron size uh, LED uh, yielding on silicon substrate. At the same time, we we're concerned about the stress uh, because once we etch uh, this silicon probe down to the 10 or you know, 30 micron, it may be bending. Uh, but uh, luckily, we can manage all this, and we made a probe here. This is the full shank probe, and having a uh, you know, Basaki configuration, eight recording channel for each shank, and having a three uh, LEDs on, on each. And when you take a look at this carefully here, uh, the, the magnified view, and this is the LED. And uh, this is a lighting LED on the US penny. And uh, you can illuminate in one LED, and also you can illuminate in three LEDs, or any combination of these LEDs. And this is actually a movie clip, and I want to show you. And uh, fun, uh, synchronize the music, but I'm not sure whether I can I can I can do it here. Um, so, you um, know the the device came out from about the Christmas time. So it was just a joke. This is like a Christmas tree inside your brain. So we can illuminate uh, your brain um, with any combination of light, any location that you want. And hopefully in the future we will put more LEDs and more recording site and multi shank configuration to the target region of the brain. So music and this. So this is actually in vivo data, which was taken from uh, the Yuri's lab. And uh, Iran did it, who is now at uh, Tel Aviv University. And uh, we can see we can illuminate the light into the, to the LED. And then we can monitor uh, the neuronal activities close. And I'm not going to talk about the detail, uh, because uh, Daniel English uh, has a poster for the recent uh, uh, the result. And uh, this one of the uh, activities very spontaneously. And the other one here, you can see that the delay, uh, the, the blue one, or uh, the more bluish one is like a base delay. It's, it's the intermediate uh, um, the activation. So uh, by having this uh, probe, we can tease out the circuit connection uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the cellular level, and then, and then to understand the circuit connectivity inside the brain, especially in this case, hippocampus. So let me talk about uh, the, uh, the high density. Um, and uh, we've been arguing this, and then uh, Oliver showed this uh, neuroscience Moore's law, and every seven years, number of 
channel density, simultaneously recording channel density doubles pretty, that's pretty slow than uh, electronic uh, device moves low. And uh, this is the few other uh, device recently um, reported. I'm not sure whether we can uh, turn the curve slope uh, more steeper in the future or we'll still stay in this uh, uh, Moore's law. But obvious thing is that we have to stay in this Moore's law, okay? And which means 2015, we are reaching up to thousand channels. Uh, Ken just to show simultaneous monitoring of 831 channels and, uh, and neurons, and, uh, and, and also a lot of channel count is coming. How are we going to handle this? And obviously, we need to uh, address uh, the number of uh, lead connection. And this is the evolution of the probe um, here, here in Michigan, uh, led by Ken, Ken Wise, you know, from passive probe. Uh, mostly mostly, mostly uh, this probe is being, being sold and commercialized through the neural access. And then we try a monolithic integration, which now has a Lamborghini uh, you know, probe by iMac, and, but this is a pretty vintage Lamborghini, um, and this has been done in 2002, uh, more than uh, 15 years ago. Uh, and you know, switch back to the hybrid integration because uh, university, we kind of catch up with the scaling and deep sub micron CMOS integration. But also, we can use the foundry service as the, uh, the Fry Freiburg's approach, and still university can pursue that uh, with the given number of large uh, funding size. Uh, and here is another uh, approach with the packaging and, and packaging with the hybrid, um, in hybrid with the circuit and any given uh, the profile that we want. So a trend here is coming to passive to active probes. We, we need to have active circuit as close to, to the, uh, the recording site to reduce the number of connections. And also we are going to accurate to chronic and Charlie gave a wonderful talk this morning, and by um, uh, having a structural variation, structural change, or even change the material and size, and we need to mitigate any tissue reaction. And the other one is heterogeneous integration, and I just showed you one example that we are integrating optical component onto the silicon probe to providing not only electrical recording and stimulation, but also optical stimulation. And the other one is now we are integrating this electronics onto the silicon probe. The one approach uh, which we are still pursuing is uh, and how are we going to do that? So the question is, do we want to do monolithic integration or to make a generic probe, or do we want it to have a, a hybrid integration? Our approach is hybrid integration because uh, as indicated by the panel member, and Patrick also mentioned that, we have to provide a lot of various configurations. So hybrid approach, we can um, in a combine with the variation of the probe and then generic uh, circuit implementation. This is one of the examples. So we can have a circuit, either that can be bonded onto the probe directly, that's one approach, like this, or it can be integrated onto the PCB through the cable, the parallel cable. So one approach here is once we have this, then we can reduce the number of uh, the connections significantly by multiplexing. And then we can assemble into the many channels. And then there's a one way uh, reach to the thousand channel. I'm going to come back to this uh, a little bit later. And uh, here, uh, the direction of this integrated circuit component has to be reduced uh, the area as well as the power. And, um, and also, important thing is the modular structure uh, in a way that you can extend it uh, easily into the multiple channels. And the question here is uh, what might be the optimal modular size? And internship has been producing 32 channel, now 64 channel, uh, and uh, unpackaged 40, 64 channel chips are available. And uh, that modularity will change over the time you know, to address the larger number of sites. And also, it has to be programmable, and that will be eventually, uh, pro, you know, give a solution to re reduction. So we are developing uh, chips, and over the years, and currently, our modularity is 128 channel chip. Uh, so that can be expanded into thousand channels, and also it can be handling 64 channels. Where we can 
uh, we don't have to use the whole channels in the chip, uh, but that is the modularity currently. And uh, I'm not gonna go into the detail of this uh, architecture, but uh, we have a lot of effort to uh, reduce the power and also uh, reduce the data rate. So by taking advantage of the power spectrum, the neural signal, we took a delta modulation and having a signal modulation at the end. And also we having a Hoffman coding, it's a lossless uh, entropy coding because sparsity of the neural signal, we can reduce uh, data rate significantly. Um, and that's also helping to uh, uh, moving on to the high density uh, recordings. And this is the, uh, the recording um, done in Josh Burke lab. Uh, it's Hong Yun Park has been working on and you can see more details in the poster. So let me talk about a few uh, thought. Uh, still, that's debatable. And we have a lot of uh, good panel discussion yesterday. And um, for high density channel beyond 1,000, and I think uh, the recording channel chip has to be fridge bonded either onto the probe or onto the PCB. It would be great if it can be reusable, but if not, we have to bite the bullet for the sake of large number of channels and reduce the number of uh, lead connections. Or some portion of the integrated circuit onto the probe shank and some portion in the hybrid that has to be provided. And modularity uh, is the essential uh, to serve the various configuration uh, depending on target, uh, region of the brain, and you may need a four shank or deeper or shallower, a lot of configuration. So it has to provide a modularity. And then here, uh, this is a famous, I, 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 I like this uh, exponential curve. When you plot the income versus each individual person in the United States, then you may see this uh, maybe, you know, this exponential curve. And same thing in college of engineering, it showed us the number of amount of a grant or project money each faculty is bringing is in vain. So how steep is this? And we can provide a couple of them variation and they can satisfy 80% of all the you know, usage. Uh, that's the thing. Or do we have this kind of slope is like that, that we need a lot of variation, uh, various configuration and satisfy to the community need. Therefore, the modularity uh, is, is essential for the scale into the high density uh, implementation. And also stacking this and then coming into the 3D, uh, that's the, uh, um, yeah, depending on in like a motor cortex and a visual cortex, you may need a 3D configuration. And optical stimulation also, the chip has to be integrated currently. We have a 48 channel optical stimulation chip uh, driving this uh, micro LEDs. And then we have a demonstration which you are interested in. Maybe my students will take you to the lab and showing you uh, this demonstration. The final question here is, can we define a standard interface so that we can have a modularity, so that I can use some of the uh, impact, you know, Freiburg's chip or Freiburg's technology and integrate it together? Uh, that is the, uh, the, we don't have to design the whole thing, uh, and then uh, that might be the good question that we want to task as a, as a community. Um, with that, I wanted to acknowledge all the uh, collaborators and uh, Yuri and, and uh, Ken still active and always inspiring, uh, the whole group and uh, previous uh, student and postdocs and funding sources, uh, these are the group and uh, these are the people who contributed uh, for the work that I just presented uh, today. Thank you very much for your attention. Work very similar to the biological uh, neural network. Okay, so I'll discuss how we are going to do that. So there's obviously a lot of interest in that. Uh, so first we know is the topic of uh, artificial intelligence, right?